let's discuss the synthesis of epoxides. And in general, we can make epoxides using one of two approaches, one involving substitution and one involving addition. The substitution process starts from a compound or a starting material in which we already have one of the ether bonds intact. And at the other carbon that's destined to become part of the epoxide, we have a good leaving group. This might be, for example, a halogen. So these two halo alcohols with a hydroxyl group linked to a carbon, which is linked to an electrophilic carbon connected to a halogen atom that can serve as a leaving group, are great substrates for the formation of epoxides. And the idea here is that we want to set up this oxygen as a nucleophile so that it can form a bond to this carbon, which is electrophilic due to the presence of the leaving group here. And to do that, we just need to make use of a base. A convenient choice, which is going to deprotonate that hydroxyl group completely, is something like sodium hydride. So treatment of this 2-halo alcohol with sodium hydride gives rise to this product, which is called ethylene oxide. In a sense, it's the oxide of ethylene, C2H4. Notice that there are four hydrogens linked to the two carbons of the epoxide ring. One important point with this substitution method is that it results in inversion of configuration at the electrophilic center. So if, for example, we start with a substrate like this, in which the electrophilic carbon is stereogenic, treatment of this substrate with a base, an intramolecular SN2, is going to lead to a product in which the configuration of that stereocenter has been inverted. And we can show that by drawing the methyl group, for example, in this position. Take a moment to verify on your own that this does in fact represent an inversion of configuration, even though the methyl group remains above the plane throughout the process. The key is that the carbon-bromine bond that broke is on the opposite side of the plane formed by the other three groups linked to the stereogenic carbon than the new CO bond. So the fact that the CO and CBR bonds are on opposite sides indicates that an inversion of configuration has occurred. The addition approach can actually be done a couple of different ways, but the use of electrophilic oxygen is the most common and probably the most important. And this makes use of a reagent called a per acid. So we start from an alkene and we treat with a per carboxylic acid. And this is a carboxylic acid containing an extra oxygen jammed between the hydroxyl quote unquote oxygen of the carboxylic acid and the carbonyl carbon, the C double bond O carbon. In a per acid, the electrophilic oxygen is the terminal oxygen, and the way to understand why that's the case is to consider what can act as a leaving group within this substrate. This oxygen I've highlighted in blue is connected to something that can serve as a leaving group, a carboxylate anion, the conjugate base of a carboxylic acid. And the reason this is a halfway decent leaving group is because you can imagine if there were a negative charge located on this oxygen, this negative charge would be delocalized but here and here. Because of the unique structure of per acids, the addition of oxygen to the alkene happens in a single step. Both bonds are formed in a single elementary step. And I'll draw that in a second, but just to show the product, we have directly after treatment with the per carboxylic acid on the alkene, the, the epoxide product. And this happens in a single elementary step via electron flow like this. The electrophilic oxygen approaches the alkene in such a way that the carbonyl oxygen, the CO double bonded oxygen, is relatively close to this acidic hydrogen connected to the end of the per acid. In one direction, electrons flow from the alkene to the electrophilic oxygen atom, and this looks like an A sub E, or association of an electrophile elementary step from the alkene's perspective, right? From this oxygen's perspective, it looks a lot like SN2, since the carboxylate portion of the per acid departs as a leaving group. But it does so in such a way that this hydrogen right here on the end of the per acid is transferred to the carbonyl oxygen as this electron flow is occurring. What this then enables is the formation of the second CO bond of the epoxide from the electrophilic oxygen actually back to the alkene. So to show this a little more clearly, I'm gonna move this first curved arrow we drew over to the other side to better illustrate that both bonds of the epoxide product are formed at the same time. So overall, this looks like something like AE plus SN2 plus proton transfer. So a lot's going on, but nonetheless, what we end up with is 
the epoxide product in a single elementary step as the per acid approaches the alkene. And even though the electron flow looks cyclic, the important point I want to make is that this is an electrophilic oxygen atom, and this is really an electrophilic addition approach to epoxidation. The important curved arrows here, you know, the things to really pay attention to are this donation of electron density from the alkene to the electrophilic oxygen and the cleavage of this OO bond. This electron flow I've highlighted in purple gives you the essence of the process from an electronic point of view. And the reason I belabor this point and emphasize it so much is that it tells us and it explains why more nucleophilic alkenes react faster. This means, for example, that more substituted alkenes will tend to react more quickly than less substituted alkenes. So tetra-substituted react fastest, followed by tri-substituted, followed by di-substituted, etc.